mine. He's one of the, uh, he's an extremely active member of Alcoholics Anonymous and an extremely respected member. Um, and uh, he's got a great smile, warm heart, good human being. Everybody loves him, good mentor. And uh, as the big book says, he's a fine specimen of manhood as one could wish to meet. So with that, I'll open it up to my, to my home dog, Mike A. Take it away, Mike. Have fun with it. Hey, thanks, Sam. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Mike Allison. I'm an alcoholic. Good evening, everybody. Hey, Mike. Uh, my sobriety date is February the 12th of 1990, and my home group is the Brentwood Full Moon Group. Uh, Brentwood Full Moon Group meets, uh, well, used to meet. We're meeting on Zoom now, but it, Brentwood's just south of Nashville where I live, and uh, we meet on Friday nights at 6.30. So if you're ever in the Nashville area, we'd love to have you around. Uh, man, Sam, thanks for uh, for inviting me to this, and it's really, uh, it's, it's caused me to do some, I, I did quite a bit of homework today and did some self-searching and uh, a little more inventory uh, because this is a great topic and, I'm, and I've, never, I've never had a chance to just specifically talk about the emotional sobriety topic, in particular this letter Bill wrote in 58 when he was, I guess, 20 years sober. And um, so I'm, I just, I've got some thoughts on, on relating to what Bill wrote and, and some of my own experiences that I just kind of want to share maybe and, and uh, maybe we can get the conversation going with that. And, you know, Bill talks about his depression and that he was dogged with depression. And, and I, was, uh, I was one of those people that uh, uh, actually, I, my, my, and, and by the way, first thing before I even talk about depression and alcoholism, I want, I want to throw a big disclaimer out here that I'm not speaking for anybody. I'm not a doctor. I'm not talking about anybody's depression, anybody else's depression, but mine. This is just my story and, and, and what happened to me. Uh, I don't ever want to influence anybody that's being treated by a doctor for clinical depression to do anything. Uh, but I just don't want to tell you how this tied into my alcoholism because uh, I, I had these great periods of, of depression that were just debilitating. I had a lot of mood swings uh, starting in my drinking career and they only worsened as my, as my alcoholism progressed. And uh, I was actually treated, my doctor put me on antidepressants for like nine and a half years before I got to AA. And maybe, you know, maybe that and Crown Royal is what kept me alive long enough to get here. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I had all the symptoms of clinical depression and that's what I thought I had. And as a matter of fact, when I went to my first AA meeting at my home group, uh, they went around the room and they did a first step meeting for me and told me their stories. And at the end of it, they said, well, you got anything you want to say? And I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm Mike. I don't know whether I'm an alcoholic or not, but I've been diagnosed with clinical depression. And about half the room just died laughing. And uh, of course, my grand sponsor said if they'd known I'd had this nine millimeter pistol in my pocket that night, they might not have laughed at me so much. So, but at any rate, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And, and I went to a treatment center and I, I, I thought I had a drinking problem uh, because I drank too much and I like all those party favors out there. So uh, I was just rocking and rolling and trying to lead. I was leading this double life of running a business and, and having a family and, and trying to act like I was somebody. And inside I was just dying from alcoholism. And I really didn't, I really didn't know what was wrong with me. I thought I was just crazy. And I get to AA and you guys tell me that I, I was going to not drink one day at a time. And so I thought, well, maybe I've got a drinking problem. And, you know, if some if somebody's new here tonight and trying to decide whether they're alcoholic or not, you know, if, if, if all I had was a drinking problem, I could just quit drinking and then I'd be fine. But I have alcoholism. You know, I found out that I've got a real case of alcoholism because when I stop drinking, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. You know, for a few days, I'm okay because I'm not throwing up or having, you know, having dry heaves out in the moonlight out in the front yard and and not having these just God horrible hangovers that I used to have. But little by little, uh, life gets so painful and that I can't stand it. And one of the first things uh, when I was first over, my sponsor, whose name was Buff, Buff Frog, uh, Buff took me down to Memphis, which is about a three hour drive from Nashville, to hear Clancy. Clancy Emerson was there. And he said two things that night that, that really struck the chord with me. He said that, the natural state for an alcoholic that's not drinking is growing depression and anxiety. 
And I thought, you know, that's me. When I stop drinking, that's when my depression gets worse. You know, and of course I was drowning myself with a depressant, but, but, but I, my depression got worse every time I quit drinking. And so I'd always go back to, to drinking or taking drugs because that's all I knew. That's the only way I could put the fire out. And I'd start the cycle over and over again. And I'd, I'd quit on my own over and over again before I got to AA, not knowing what was really wrong with me. And the other thing Clancy said that night was, is that the thing that makes alcoholism a fatal disease is that sobriety eventually becomes emotionally unbearable. And I thought, bingo, man, that is me. I was so unhappy. I had spent all my life chasing uh, joy and happiness and pleasure any way I could possibly get it. And it just wound up killing me at the age of, 20, of 39. I was 39 when I got here and I just, my life was over. I didn't have a plan to kill myself, but I just didn't want to wake up every day because it was one miserable day after, after another. So, you know, when I, I get to this treatment center, that, that tells me I need to go to AA. That's how I went to AA. But when I'm at this treatment center, a psychiatrist that looked, looked at me over and saw my chart, he said, you know, he said, I think you've been misdiagnosed. He said, I'm gonna start weaning you off these pills, these antidepressants. Cause he said, I don't think you have clinical depression. He said, I, I just think you suffer from alcoholism. And he said, if you go do those people at AA tell you to do and take those 12 steps, he said, I think your depression will be lifted. And at that point in time, I was willing to do anything. And the guy over a period of time kept cutting my medication down more and more until he weaned me off of it. And I was just a little uncomfortable from it. And, 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 but, but I did it under the care of a doctor and son of a gun, he was right. Cause when I went to AA and I started taking the actions of the steps, not just going to going to meetings and not drinking, that didn't do anything, but make me crazy after a while. But when I, when I finally got, got desperate enough to start taking some action to the steps, all of a sudden I started, I started feeling a, a sense of ease and comfort that I'd never had before. And uh, so, uh, you know, once the, this depression started leaving me and I'm going to meetings and talking the talk and learning the lingo and making all these friends and stuff, in the back of my mind, I was afraid that this depression might return. Because it's, it's a scary time. There's there's times when I've had depression where I just couldn't get out of bed. I'm just curled up in a ball and I couldn't do anything. And so I had a fear of that, much like Bill says in that letter that he wrote. Um, but what I've what I've heard others say is that if if all you're doing is suffering from alcoholism, all you have to do is take some action to get out from under. It. And as painful as that is, you know, when I'm in when I'm in a depressed state, and I've I've had that off and on in my sobriety. I hadn't had it for quite a while now, but I still have it. Uh, my first inclination is to say, well, I just need to take a day off. You know, I just need to take care of myself self better. And I just, need, and you know what I do? All I do is just think about me when I'm doing that. And if my, the way my depression works, the more I think about it and think about what I need to get out of it, the worse it gets. I mean, the what I've got to do is get out of get out of myself and just go help somebody, whether it's somebody in AA, or doing some twelve step work or anything to get me out of me, uh, and th and that always that always seems to work. Um, you know, Bill was uh, uh, he said that he thought that the key to that was uh, his realization of all the attachments that he had, and uh, you know, I didn't. Uh, I didn't realize I had so many attachments and dependencies on, on people. I, uh, I'd run away from church after I, after I got old enough to run away from church with my parents. And uh, I hung around the church a little bit when I got married to my wife and then I left again. And when I came to AA, I was, I was just a savage. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have any, I was spiritually dead. I didn't, I didn't have any spiritual connection at all, uh, no beliefs at all. You know, if there was a God, I hope he couldn't find me because I was doing all the wrong things. I was, I was breaking commandments that hadn't been written down yet, I think. And, uh, and so I, I, I was just a savage and I didn't have any kind of belief system whatsoever. And so, but looking back on that, um, everybody's got a higher power. I mean, I had a higher power when I didn't think I had a higher power. And I'm sitting there 
struggling around trying to find this God of my understanding, all that stuff. Heck, I've always had a higher power. Whatever I lean on for support is what I use for a higher power. You know, I've had, and, and since I got sober, I found out all the things that I, all these attachments, as Bill calls them, they were all uh, things that I thought were higher powers. I mean, uh, my father was my higher power. You know, and it took me a long time, several inventories to recognize that, that he was the guy that had some money and some influence. And I always wanted him in my corner where I could get out of trouble when I was a kid. And so I put him on a pedestal that he didn't want to be on. Uh, I've had my wife as, as my higher power. Uh, that doesn't work very well. Uh, and because there's a lot of times that my marriage has been in jeopardy, that that's not the perfect higher power. Uh, I've had my business and my job as my higher power, and it went up and down like a yo-yo, as I'll, as I'll tell you here in a little bit. Uh, I used AA in general in the meetings, and my I've had my sponsor as a higher power. And at one time, my sponsor got a little wacky. He had a lot of personal problems in his life, and he wasn't available. So, you know, a bank account, a bottle of Crown Royal, you know, you, you name it. I've, I've used all that stuff as a higher power because that's what I leaned on. And what had to happen to me for me to find uh, some stability and something to believe in is that all those worldly things that I that I'd used had to fail at some point in time, and I was left with there's got to be something out there that's a higher power that, that that's got to be a higher power, you know, that doesn't have flaws. And my concept of God has really changed a lot since I've come here. Um, there were times, I mean, my sponsor had me praying on my knees and asking God to direct my day and thank him for keeping me clean and sober and faithful to my wife at night. I'd do that and I was praying on my knees. And sometimes I would, I just think, man, I don't believe any of this stuff. You know, it's like I was praying to air sometimes. I just have this total lack of faith. But at the same time, uh, I heard a guy named Mo Holler, who was an old timer in Nashville say that that uh, you don't have to feel spiritual to be spiritual. And again, rather than what I'm thinking and feeling, which is what I try to get out of my depression, what I'm thinking and feeling about my spiritual life doesn't have anything to do with it. If I take the action, all of a sudden I'm starting to get the payoff. Um, so I started getting, I had to get more comfortable with the God of my understanding that's, that's still changing uh, for right now. Um, you know, when I first got sober, of course I thought, after I quit drinking and joined AA, that my business that was really falling apart, it had been real successful for a long time and it was just falling apart because of my alcoholism. I really thought as soon as I got sober, man, my business was just gonna take off like a rocket and everything would be great. Well, it didn't because I'd made a lot of bad decisions for a long time. And it took a couple of years for my business to bottom out and my finances to bottom out because I had all this wreckage of the past. But I kept, uh, I kept doing all the commitments I had in AA because I just grabbed onto this thing because it's the only thing that's ever worked for me. And it seemed it seemed like a good thing. And also, my friend Cliff from Oklahoma City said, you know, if you make it to AA, you might as well just stay here because we don't refer you down to anywhere else. I mean, hell, this is the ground floor. And so this is all I had, all I had left to do. Thank God it worked. But at any rate, my I'm working hard and, and I'm trying to do AA the best of my ability. I'm going, I'm taking the steps. And uh and my life starts getting better at home. And then my business starts getting really good. And I'm thinking, hey, look what I've done. You know, I got sober, I got myself sober and you know, now I'm working hard now I'm now I'm being successful again, I am somebody. And the problem with that was is about, I don't know, five or six years into sobriety, all of a sudden for no, no reason, no fault of mine, my business just fell apart. I mean, it just, I just, Several things happened and my business just took a nosedive where I couldn't even pay myself for about six months. And my wife is saying, you know, where, where's, where's the money where, where we can survive? And I'm saying, look, I got to keep this monster going to keep these other people paid, my employees and, and vendors and all that stuff to keep the thing going. We're just going to have to hang on until it gets better. And when I eventually, without, without and I want to throw all my AA commitments away again and just focus on my work. But something told me to stick with AA. You know, I got to build, I got to build my life around AA. I don't, I don't build AA around my life when, when I have time for it. I, I got to do that in reverse. And so I kept, kept doing all my commitments and, uh, and I kept working. And eventually I worked my way out of this financial hole that we'd gotten in. 
Now, after I got through that period of time, I looked back in the time where I was really struggling, where, you know, we couldn't pay our bills personally. And, you know, and I was really struggling personally, financially. You know, I, I never was worried about living under the interstate overpass on I-40 out there close to where my farm was. And I wasn't worried about my kids eating dog food. It was, how am I going to look? It was all about how am I going to look? You know, oh, this guy had this business and he blew it. You know, it was all my ego. And so there was that attachment that I thought I was so wrapped up in who I was with this business. You know, that mattered so much. That that was the stressful part of that. And that was, I didn't have any emotional sobriety at that point in time. Um, fast forward, business gets good again. It gets real good. And I build this great big shop building that I'd always wanted and had all this equipment in it that I'd always wanted. I had every, every kind of toy and tool that I had ever wanted before. And then one night, some unknown arsonist burned it to the ground. I mean, I woke up on a Saturday morning and saw the, the you know, the charred hulk of, of all my dreams had just barbecued about five o'clock that morning. And by the way, they never did catch who did it. And I had to, I had to, my sponsor said I had the worst kind of resentment because I had resentment against somebody that I didn't even know who it was that burned it down. So I had to pray for unknown arsonists for a long time to get over that. But, but when that, that building burned down, uh, all of a sudden, that was every material toy that I ever wanted just vanished. And, and again, I had gotten to the point where I thought I've arrived. I've got all this stuff now. And, and I was living much like I was before when I was a drunk, like, look at me, I got this business, I am somebody. But then all of a sudden all that was gone. And so I realized that, that I, again, I was putting more, more faith in material stuff and, and how I was looking on the outside than I, than I was on the inside. And about that time, uh, when all this is going on, all of a sudden I came to the realization. It's amazing to me the realizations that I get as I, as I'm, as I stay sober. Some of them are early on, and then some of them take a long time, a long time. And this was like maybe 10 years into sobriety, I suppose. It dawned on me one day that if you gave, if I wanted you to give me the ultimate compliment, the compliment I'd much rather hear than anything else you could tell me, I'd want to know what a hard worker I was. And part of that goes back to when I was a kid. Um, I got some self-esteem. I thought if I was a hard worker that my dad would, would respect me. And I carried that into my adult life. And, but there I was, I'm, you know, 50 years old and been sober for quite a while. And I, and I still think if, I, if, if I'd want you to say the best thing about me was what a hard worker I was. Not that I was a good husband or a good father, that I was a hard worker. And I thought, how shallow is that? And I went in and I told that in my Monday night men's meeting and there for months, I'd go in there every Monday night and they'd say, hey, how's the hardworking son bitch doing today? You know, and so they helped me, they helped me get to the bottom of that. And so I started uh, at that point in time, maybe that's when I started undoing some of this baggage I had of what I, what I thought I was supposed to be. And, 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 and just it wasn't a conscious effort to try to drift toward helping others more, but that's just kind of where I went because I got sick and tired of, of me and my image. Um, at some point in time, you know, after I'd gone through the steps and, and the promises came true for me and I'm, I've got the 10th step where I'm, I'm trying to stay current with this wreckage of the present that I, I seem to, to build up from time to time. Uh, when I get through with, with, with in, in the 10th step and then I've got an 11th step where I try to get closer to this God of my understanding that I still don't understand, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm seeking all the time. And I've got this God in my life. And then the 12th step, you know, I, I had a spiritual awakening. Something was different. Something had changed in me after I took the steps like it does to everybody. And I'm trying to practice these principles best as I can in all my affairs and sponsoring people and giving, giving this thing away. And I'm in AA. My wife's in Al-Anon. You know, our sons were in al -Ateen. We're in Al-A-Dog and Al-A-Cat and everything you can belong to. I mean, we thought we were the recovered family. And then one day I get a call from my younger son's uh, eighth grade principal and said they'd caught him with some marijuana in his shoe and and uh, they have zero tolerance for drugs and guns in, in, in Tennessee and they said he's out of school for a year come get him right now 
And I remember thinking, well, you don't understand. We're the recovery family. You know, this, this can't be happening to us. And, and I mean, it crushed my ego because I thought, boy, we're, we've got it together. And again, I was, rather than just trying to, uh, to live a good life and be of service, I'm trying, to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get good and be good and, and be known like I'm good and got this thing. And um, I learned something else I want to share with you right quick about that too, because uh, my son was thrown out of, out of school for a year and eventually we got him enrolled in an alternative learning center uh, for, for that year's time. And the problem was, is I had to leave my work about 1.30 every, or about, one, about quarter after one every day and drive into Nashville and pick up my son within a five minute window. I'd get him between uh, five minutes to two and two o'clock every day for a year. And I'd, I had to pick him up in that five minute window and I either had to take him way back out to my place of work, which was all the way across the county or to our house in the south part of the county and then go all the way back to the west county where my work was. And I had to work extra hours for that year and when that happened. And the first thing I thought of is I have such, I have such contempt prior to investigation. It's just, it just baffles me sometimes. I mean, I'm thinking, was this my reward for staying sober and sponsoring all these guys that my kid gets kicked out of school for weed and, and I got to go pick him up every day, leave work and have to go back to work and work extra hours, which I had to do for a whole year. And I'm thinking, is that my reward for doing all this? But what it did, it forced me to spend time with my son that I wouldn't spend with him because I worked all the time. It forced me to ride with him. Sort of like that meeting, that ride to the meeting and the ride back from the meeting that we all get, get the most out of. I got to do that with my son every day, five days a week for a year. And I got to know my son on a level that's priceless. Um, he just turned 39 last week. And uh, he's lived in Northern California for uh, 19 years. And uh, he's an awful lot like me. He's an awful lot like me in a lot of ways. And uh, uh, he's had times where he's in and out of, of, of not drinking. And um, he, he went to a speaker meeting with me uh, here uh, when he was here about a year and a half ago. And after he left, I called him and I said, look, I'm really proud of you for not drinking. And I hope that works for you. And uh, I said, I want you to know something though. Uh, you know what AA means to me that I spent so much time with AA. And I said, I want you to know that I love you just the way you are. And uh, I, I want you to know that I would never think any less of you if you never go to AA. You know, whatever you do is your business. You're, you know, you're a grown ass man and I, and I love you just the way you are. And he said, well, thanks. I appreciate you telling me that. He said, but I see what it's doing for you. So I've left that door open. And because I had to spend time with him that, that year, that's built a relationship that's lasted all these years. And I wouldn't have had that otherwise. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, as far as getting back to being the, the hardworking SOB I was talking about, you know, I've been retired from that business about 16 and a half years now. And, and nobody ever even asked me what I used to do for a living. They could care less what I ever did for a living. And, and for years, I thought that was so important what I, what I did for a living. Uh, and finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about something that's, that, that I had that was a long-standing problem for me. And sometimes it was acute, and sometimes it was just kind of in the background. Um, I don't want to say how many years this has lasted because it might scare some, some people off here that, that haven't been around for a long time. But, but I, I've spent a good portion of my sobriety uh, with the real deep-seated feeling that I am less than. And that um, in spite of the, the successes I've had in AA and, and the good life I had, uh, there's, there's just times where I think, man, you know, yeah, you did all this and you made all these amends, but you know, you really are still just a piece of crap. You know, and I've, I've had, I've, I've had that dog me for a long time. And I've, I've started to come to terms with some of it. I, this deep sense of self-loathing, I don't know where the heck that comes from. Um, but, um, but, but that, 
That's bothered me in the background for a long time. Now, I've, I've come to find out, and, and, and part, of, part of what I thought was, was even fueling that was that, that I tell my story a lot. I get invited to tell my story, and my, and my wife tells her Al and I story. And my story, part of my story is that, that I started cheating on my wife, uh, you know, for several years before I got sober. And, uh, and we're real public about that, about what we went through and, and how long it took. I mean, it took me five and a half years to make amends to her that were satisfactory to her, uh, to even start a relationship uh, that I have today. And, and we've been married 45 years now. Uh, but, and she stuck with me and I'm, I'm so grateful for that. But we, we both talk about that in our stories and I don't like talking about that stuff. I really don't. I, I, I don't like talking about that stuff. But we we've, we've decided that there's that that's a way that we can help somebody maybe walk through it for them, and so we share that really openly. And it's uh, uh it's still painful to uh, uh to hear her her side of it, you know, because that's just part of it. But what I have learned is it's okay to look at you know look at the past, look back at the past, but just don't stare. You know. Um, sometimes I think, you know, I, I really wish I wouldn't have to talk about that stuff anymore I, and all this other crazy stuff I did. I cut down my neighbor's trees and he sued me. And that's a whole big long story that I don't have time to tell. Uh, and, and sometimes I think, man, I just wish I could just move on and not have to talk about all that past stuff in the back that was back there. However, uh, the book says that our dark past is our greatest asset. And I was listening to a guy's fifth step some time ago. And, uh, and I remember when I told my, when I did my fifth step with my sponsor, uh, he told, he showed me in the book where, where invariably people got drunk that kept secrets. And so I wrote down every secret that I could, I could think of that I didn't want to tell anybody. And I wrote it all down, some of it down in code. So if they pan, somebody pounded a piece of paper, they wouldn't know what it meant. And so when I did this fifth step with my sponsor, you know, he invited God in the room and he said, what's the worst thing on your list? And so I told him, you know, something that was written in code that I didn't want to tell anybody. And I really thought he was just going to say, you know, what an order, you know, I can't do this. But instead he told me the worst thing that was on his fifth step list. I mean, this man, this was another alcoholic that loved me enough uh, to tell me his deepest, darkest secret and his fifth step to make me comfortable where I would, could empty this garbage can of stuff I've been carrying around. Some of it that it was just poison. It was just stuff I just need to get out. Um, and, uh, and I've never forgotten that, that he did that for me, you know, that he loved me enough to do that. And so every time I listen to a guy's fifth step, I ask him, what's the worst thing on your list? And then I tell him what the worst thing on my list was because it, do, it doesn't have any power over me anymore. And so I'm riding in the car on a Saturday morning some time ago, and there's a guy in there with me, and and uh, and I invited God in the car with us, and I said, "What's the worst thing on your list?" And the guy said, "Told me something. He told me something." And he was kind. Of, it was kind of a general statement. And so I asked him a question about it, and he answered my question. And as soon as he answered the question. I told him the worst thing it was on my fist step list. And then he he was silent. He was he just paused for a minute. And he got real still, and I could see a shift in the whole conversation. And he said, you know, I didn't tell you the truth, man. He go, let me tell you what really happened. And by me sharing my deepest, darkest secret with him, that helped him feel comfortable enough to get this poison out of him. And that stuff has value. You know, that stuff has value. Um, so our dark past is our greatest asset. And, you know, when I'm going through this stuff and I was getting tired of feeling like this piece of crap inside, uh, one of the other things I started realizing is I've been taking the inventory of all the bad stuff I've done all my life. And an inventory, you're supposed to take the good stuff too. You're supposed to have an inventory of the good. And I never did that. I took the inventory of the bad, the stuff I need to make amends for. And what I had to do was start making an inventory of, of the stuff that, that maybe I was doing right. You know, and it's not because I'm a great guy and this wonderful guy, this smart guy, this 
full of self-help. Uh, it's because I've just been living, I've been living right. I've been, I, you know, my, my sponsor and my grand sponsor and, and other men and women in AA have, have given me the skills to have a chance to be the kind of husband and father and grandfather and brother and son and friend that I always wanted to be, you know, and I've been doing some of those things. And sometimes I'm taking action and I don't want to take the action, but I take it anyway. You know, there's no wrong reason for taking the right action. And so I start having to look, look down and say, well, golly, you're not that guy you were before you came in here in 1990. You know, you know, I know I'm not supposed to cheat on my wife, but I ain't cheated on my wife in 31 years now. And, and I'm doing some other things that are right. And I'm thinking, well, golly, if, if God's forgiven me for this stuff, what the, who am I to say that I can't be forgiven for this stuff? You know, God's given me this chance to have this, uh, this life that I, that I certainly don't, I don't think I deserve it that I never expected to get. You know, I thought I was a dead man at 39 and should have been. And here I am, I've, I've been able to be some use to some people all this time. So taking that inventory, not in a prideful way, but just the facts uh, has helped me get over that stuff about uh, feeling like I'm at that piece of crap. Um, and by the way, you know, doing the right thing, uh, I try to do that the best of my ability. That's what gives me peace. If, uh, helping others and, and rather than trying to seek joy and happiness and pleasure all the time, if I'm helping somebody else doing the right thing, all of a sudden I've got that joy and peace coming at me that I wasn't even looking for. You know, I just it just starts attracting to me. And, and when I do that, I take better care of myself too. Um, let's see. You know, I've said about all I need to say, I think. Um, I'm really grateful that uh, the fact that I get to get to do this tonight. Thanks, Sam, because you really, uh, uh, this, is, this has helped me realize kind of where I'm at right now and that I got some work to do. Uh, I try to do the right thing every day, but I'm telling you, I still have some crazy ideas. You know, uh, Buff used to say, you know, some days I'm free and some days I'm just at large. And, and I still get some crazy ideas in my head, but I, but I have a sponsor that, I, that I've always been accountable to. And he and I have been good friends for years, but he's my sponsor and he's the guy that I take direction from. Um, he's a guy that's an unemotional third party to all my problems. Uh, that can give me the guidance uh, that I need. He shines a flashlight for me in the dark. And I seem to be able to shine the flashlight in the dark for other guys, but I can't seem to shine it for me. So I've always had a sponsor to help guide me and keep me grounded in that. And uh, I just want to tell you, I love all you guys. I love AA and I really love this good life. So thanks for letting me share. I hope that gets the conversation started. Mike, man, thank you. That was beautiful. Uh, it hit all the notes too. I tell you, I had the same thing, man. I was sober for a long time and I, this, that needing that approval, that dad approval. I don't know where that came from, man, but it was like, I was, I bought this real expensive condo and I picked my dad up in this Porsche. I'd always felt like such a screw up, you know, and I picked him up in the airport in a Porsche and brought him to this new condo that I'd done all by myself, you know, and, uh, he came in and, you know, he, he just, he didn't give two shits about that condo and it wasn't, he wouldn't, he wasn't being mean. He wasn't being rude. He was just like, he's just being cool. It's just like, it didn't matter to him at all. You know, one way or another, he would have been happy in my apartment, but I was like, he's really going to be impressed with this. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was so funny that like when he left, I, I actually said out loud, why did I buy this fucking place? <laughs> and I can't believe that I said that, you know what I mean? Like the whole, like that, and I said it out loud, like that was the whole reason. I didn't realize I'd even done all that just for that moment. You know, like it, it didn't even, I just finally realized that I was doing all this stuff to try and get this approval. And it's just amazing how a lot of that stuff sticks around, but man, you hit, you hit every note. This is how we, uh, we do this is you pick a few people on this uh, Hollywood squares thing. Um, so please feel free to uh, raise your hand if you'd like to share. And uh, also, you, you just pick people, Mike. You just look at them and pick on them because a lot of people won't share after something like that. They just want to absorb it, you know. Uh, so you just gotta, part, is this you the part where all the cameras get turned off? That's right. Then you just got to start <laughs> running <laughs> people. Yeah. Golly, I can I cannot say. Uh, let's see. Is anybody raising their hands? Surely somebody wants to get us going here. Help a brother out. 
I'm telling you, you just got to thump them. You want me to do it or you want to do it? How about you, Dawn? Dawn, I love Dawn. Hi there. Thank you so much for sharing. That was awesome. Um, I was listening to you and what's been coming forward for me recently is false pride. And I've never quite known what it meant. And I really didn't want to know, to be honest with you. I just knew it was something that like was kind of a little bit over my head. And um, I've been reading up on it. And uh, one of the things I came up with actually is just being me isn't good enough. And um, that was, uh, I've been kind of studying this a little bit, like going over this whole false pride thing, because I'm in a, a book study and pride came up as part of what we were reading. And I thought, what is, what's really going on here? And you listen to the, um, the reading, the emotional sobriety reading, and Bill talks in there a lot about having the cart before the horse and that top approval attachment. And um, that's my thing, you know, that's, that's the thing I have. It's, I, there are other things like romance, perfect romance. I don't remember what the other one is off the top of my head. But those aren't the things that I'm, I'm really attached to. What I'm really attached to is top approval. And the person, you know, I, went, I was in a graduate school and I had like a, a perfect grade point average and there was no pat on the back whatsoever coming from me. And everybody else could like, oh, that's great, that's great. And I was like, man, it is what it is. And um, I realized there's something wrong with this. There's something wrong that I can't, that, I mean, it's a huge sense of false pride that I can't even say you did a good job. You did a good job. And, um, and be okay with it. So I'm kind of like working, I hate to say working because when I start working on something, my whole thing is to get an A and get it right. And I'm really trying to move away from that ideology. But um, I know that the, the gifts that I've been given have absolutely come through grace. And it, you know, it's an unmerited gift. Now, does that mean I don't do anything right? No, of course not. But oftentimes what I do comes from the wrong place. My motives are what are attached. It's, and like yourself, I've been sober long enough that if you follow me around, you're probably not gonna know what's going on because it's not gonna look that bad on me. It's gonna look pretty good, like I'm doing the right thing. But the question is, am I doing the right thing for the right reason? And oftentimes I'm just trying to prove to the world just like Bill, that I'm good enough, that I'm capable enough, and that I'm enough, I'm enough, I'm enough, when in fact, I'm enough without all that. And that's the, um, the thing that allows me to have a sense of humility around the fact that I so desperately, even now, I've been sober like yourself since, for, since 1990, and I still need God in my life in such a way that allows me to continue to let go of the things that stand between me and the truth. And right now, the things that I'm attached to, I'm finding out is this whole false pride thing. And the and I didn't even know. I I mean I I kind of knew it was a thing, and I've heard it so much, but I'm really my eyes are waking up to oh this is what's affecting me right now. And, um, you know, I've, we were talking a little bit there at the beginning before the meeting got started about, you know, where will this, where will this meeting go during COVID? Is it going, what's going to happen after COVID and all this and that? And, you know, this past year has been such a fundamentally un, like the knots that I had tangled up that confused me about what is really going in my life. Have, are starting to just unravel. And I don't know whether, you know, there are various theories on, you know, time in the program and when you go through the growth spurts and, you know, there are certain times when people are just like banged against the wall and everybody knows it's coming. I'm not going to say what they are because if you're coming up on one, you'll be like, oh no, not me. But um, this thing that I've been, uh, COVID has really, really placed me in a position where I've had to deal with self in reality. And one of the reasons that I have to do is because I live alone. I mean, there, there's nobody else to blame. Like I used to, when there was um, step six and seven, 
I used to say, well, if there was nobody around, I wouldn't have these defects. <laughs> I got news for you. These are not facts. That is not true. That has been proven this, this year that I live by myself with myself and I want to leave myself half the time. And um, so I'm really kind of, I can't say I'm grateful for COVID. I mean, a lot of the stuff that goes on in my life that has caused me to have to really shine the flashlight back on myself have been times when it's been uncomfortable. Let's just call it that, uncomfortable. But um, it's really hard to avoid false pride when there's nobody else in the room. It's really hard to pretend like I'm pleasing somebody else when there's nobody else in the room. And um, so I'll be back next week. I have been so grateful to hear because I need, I still need the recovery that comes from people such as yourself that share in this meeting. And thank you. And thank you, the guys who keep it going. Thanks, Donald. Uh, how about Joel in Phoenix? My name is Joel and I'm a real alcoholic. Hey, Joel. Joel. I was really hoping nobody would call me. I mean, I mean the stuff that, that you said hit home so strongly about, you know, outside everything looks good, but inside I still feel like I'm a piece of crap. I, I that, that like just zingo. I mean, and, and the reading also about being dependent on other people's approval and stuff like that. You know, the last couple of days I reached out to help somebody and I left a phone message. And then last night I was at a, a big book study and I, and I posed a question and I felt like I got slighted in the, in the, re, the return response. Like, and I carry that shit. I don't, I am so still dependent upon other people's approval or, or some, some positive feedback. You know, uh, if I leave a message on the phone, I expect you guys to call me back, you know, and when that doesn't happen, I start feeling like a shit. You know, I'm still so dependent. I had a sponsor b before I asked uh, Don Pritz to be my sponsor. I had this fellow named um, uh, Dan Lettera, who was sponsored by Clancy. And the stuff he told me back then is still true to this day. It's like, what other people think of you, Joel, is none of your business. Damn, damn, damn. I mean, it's like still hard. It's still, I'm 70 years old and inside I still feel like a messed up little kid. And I love this meeting because I realized, you know, just because I got a lot of time in the program, I still got this fucking spiritual malady that's kicking my butt. And it's nice to know it's kicking other people's butts too. Anyhow, I, I need this, this kind of sharing on this level, you know, because it's alcoholism, not alcoholism. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. I think we got some guys raising their hand. We got uh, Rick A from Boca Raton. Rick, you, uh, you around? I, I, as soon as I can figure out how to unmute. There we go. I'm in. Yeah. Hey, um, Mike, hey, thank you so much for, for your story, your honesty, that share. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a grateful Alanonic, and I stumbled into this meeting recently, and, um, and I've wanted to come back because so much of what I'm hearing in this meeting is, is resonating with my life, just this, this dependence on other people and this, um, you know, this, this, um, idea of, I mean, when you were talking earlier about working like and working and working and missing that connection with your kids and, and what was I working for was really, I mean, really, if I have to examine my motives, it was self-seeking and, um, it, you know, in fact, you know, um, I, I bumped into a guy and, and, you know, we both had the same reading in our pockets. And it's this one on page 86 of the big book. It says, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, 
or self-seeking motives. And, you know, that's, that's definitely, you know, one of my issues. And um, the more I talk about it, the more I hear about it, and the more I hear other people sharing about it, um, the better I am and the less likely I am to, to give into that stuff. Uh, I've been in Al-Anon now for nine years. Um, and, uh, you know, I am becoming this year, I am becoming so aware, uh, really, and with the help of this big book and Bill's writings, so aware of, of what my mo real true motives are. And um, I just want to thank you. Thank you for your share. So thank you. Hey, thank you. It looks like we have uh, Richard. Richard, you're up. Thanks, Mike, for the, that share. I really, really, really enjoyed it. The, the fifth step, you know, when I when I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a fifth step, one of the things I always want to make sure is that uh, they feel as though they've done the best that they can at that time. Yeah. You know, and, uh, I, I, I often use humor as a way to uh, <laughs> maybe maintain my sobriety, but uh, <laughs> You know, I heard uh, I heard you referenced as Chainsaw Mike, and I thought, oh, like axe murder, mass murder? Who's this Chainsaw Mike? Now I understand. I'll just have to talk to your neighbor. And, uh, you know, Don, uh, just a little, you know, I figured out somewhere along the line that the easiest time for me to lie is when I'm by myself. And uh, I've gone through this COVID living alone, and and it has been a, 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 an awakening of sorts and also a little crazy at times. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, I always say I would never do anything to jeopardize my sobriety. Um, maybe that's as easy as breathe, but I like to stay positive that uh, there's no reason in the world for me to ever drink. Yeah. I have an allergy and, a, and, and, a, and a, as long as I realize it's not outside issues <laughs> that ever made me drink alcoholically, I seem to be okay. So thanks for sharing tonight, Mike. Thanks, Richard. And we have uh, Marisol, is that the right way? Is that how pronounce your name? Yes, it is. Um, hi, my name is Marisol, Soul, and um, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a mother of two beautiful girls. And I just want to say thank you, Mike, because you touched a lot of points um, that apply to my life. You know, um, you've given me the courage to even talk about something that happened in my life. Um, that I really don't discuss it because um, of shame and um, guilt and the depression that leads to um, like a trigger. Um, but I realized that, you know, my life had become unmanageable. Um, sorry. Um, and uh, my life turned to 360. Um, I lost a daughter in a car accident with my first drink. Um, um, and that was not my rock bottom. Um, I was 27 when I took that first drink. And when I was 29, I was heading to prison with a 10 year sentence. Um, I didn't know how to mourn instead of, like you said something about, I was staring at the, of the problem instead of mourning her and honoring her death. Um, I couldn't let it go. I couldn't look forward. And I became really depressed. Um, but I'm so glad that in, in prison, I was able to, to surrender and ask God for help. And, um, you know, I met people with AA and I started realizing that I'm, I wasn't alone, that they had stories just like mine and they didn't judge me. They, um, it, it took courage to actually bring it out because my mom always told me, you know, don't say the reason why you're in there, but, um, you know, when they were doing the fourth step, you know, about um, doing the inventory, you know, I realized that I needed to let some things go. Uh, and forgiving myself was one of the first things that I had to do. And, you know, um, in page 62 of the blue book, it talks about that life is dramatic. 
and we need to stop trying to play God and, you know, be responsible for the actions that we make. And, you know, loss is a big trigger for alcoholics and it's extreme example of self-will run riot. We alcoholics must be rid of selfishness and self-centeredness. And that was a character defect that I had that I didn't even realize that I had. Um, you know, I would make somebody's trouble mine instead of just, you know, showing empathy or sympathy um, by being a good listener or just by, you know, going and doing it and like mourning and just letting it go. You know, that with my daughter, you know, her memory was still going to be there, but I guess at the time I just couldn't see it. And, you know, um, and I knew that, you know, grief is natural now. I learned that and that we can't heal what we don't feel. And we have to go through the process, you know, when we run, it takes longer to heal, you know, and um, on the sixth step of, of the stages of grief, you know, the first step is denial, and then the second one's anger, and then bargaining, and then depression, and then acceptance, and, you know, um, on the sixth step, it's, it's supposed to be meaning, so whenever I give my testimony, just like you gave your testimony, you know, passing the message in AA to others, is my meaning and it has given me strength and you know um i don't feel that that pain anymore you know that i used to have um and i know that you know she's always going to be in my memory and she will be there now and forever you know so i'm so thankful that i have uh, been able to apply you know these steps in my in my life you know, and it's been a big asset by me sharing and, and letting know others what AA did for me. And it never ends. You know, I learn daily by shares, you know, and I feel a sense of security. So thank you, Mike, for sharing that. It really just opened um, some more meanings in my life. So thank you. And I will carry this, that share um, forever. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Wow, beautiful. Nobody ever wants to raise their hands up or share like that. So we really have to pick on somebody. So, but I know that Matthew Berg's been sitting there thinking about raising his hand for the best little while. So we're going to call on him. What's up, Matthew? Uh, hey, Sam. Hey, everybody. Um, hey, Mike. Wow. What a, that was lovely, really, uh, what you shared. And uh, I could, um, you know, really connect with a lot of like, well, just about everything. I, I just feel like I, um, but the, a couple of the things that, uh, uh, touched me were the thing about your son getting in trouble. And then that became this opportunity, um, for you to have a relationship. Uh, my son's in trouble right now and he's off the video games and it's like, we're having, it's like, he's got to get in trouble for us to connect. Um, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's some, <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Um, but I, you know, I don't know, I'm trying not to lose my, um, my head uh and uh lean on you guys and lean on uh god and um i, I just i haven't i haven't gotten any payback um for exerting my for, for exerting force uh with my children um and i know it didn't work for me it made me thirsty <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I'm trying. <laughs> uh, so anyways, I, I, um, I don't know. And then the whole business thing, oh my gosh, I could so relate to that. I had this and, and it was, there wasn't anything wrong with it, but I, I was very identified with a, a former business I had and, and was doing some stuff that I thought was real important. Um, and, uh, it was hard to walk away from. And it turned out that it was the best thing that I could have done. You know, then they got a beautiful family and happily married and all that stuff. But I also struggle with these things that you guys are all talking about, you know, with regards to, um, you know, that self-loathing. I, God, I, I get that. Um, and just a real uh, sense of fear and anxiety that is um, often makes no sense. I really can't even logically tell you there's a reason for it i'll just wake up and feel that way and and then i pray and then i'll get like this morning i had a chance to get in a book with somebody who's who's interested and and uh 
and I, like you, man, I felt better. So it just seems like, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'll ever be the way that I want to be inside, but I know that when I do these things, something happens and, uh, and, and it seems it's, it's, it's working and I get to be more the guy I want to be. And, uh, I like that whole thing about not staring. You can look back, but don't stare. Uh, that morbid reflection. It's so easy um, to kind of, uh, in the same way that I'll, that I can puff myself up, you know, is to just pulverize myself and, and that's just not useful. Um, so thank you so much, Mike. It's, a, it's really a pleasure uh, hearing you and, and being at this meeting. And thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. I know that uh, Michael and Jessica Platt want to share tonight. I can tell they're eating dinner and they've been thinking about it. And Michael really does. And so does Jessica. So we're going to unmute them and just let them bring us some truth. What's going on? My name's Mike. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, and I'm pretty sure she is too, but I'll let her just figure that out. Um, yeah, yeah, Michael, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your share, man. Um, I actually just got off the phone with a sponsee who's having a, a bit of a tough time. Not really a tough time, but he's kind of, you know, he's, he's recently out of a treatment center and um, he's kind of having, you know, he's already cried wolf once where the first time he, he uh, went in treatment and got out, family was all behind him. And now the second time around he's relapsed and now people are very skeptical. He's going through the, the, um, why, what, you know, why don't they trust me kind of thing? You know, he was saying how he was in kind of a, a crappy mood the other day and at, at a family function and, and the parents were, and sister were like, are you okay? Are you sober? Is everything, you know, they're all just like descending on him. And he's like, I wish they just leave me alone and, you know, know that I'm okay. And I'm kind of going, well, we're talking about empathy and how, you know, you know Sam and I used to do this meeting in Nashville um, and she still goes to it. It's a, uh, it's a, um, at a sober living on Wednesdays, it's, it's a book study. And he basically goes through the entire chapter, like we agnostics or more about alcoholism and he just kind of breaks it down almost sentence by sentence. And he was talking about um, this, this part in, you know, I believe it was we agnostics where uh, his, his, his thinking is like, kind of like, 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 well, he was, he was talking about how when he was younger, like you'd be at a funeral or just having a lack of empathy basically. And how it, he just couldn't understand what was wrong with him. And he just was talking about, and I related to that big time because I've been at funerals where my best friend died and everyone's crying. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out why I can't feel these emotions, why I couldn't feel, I couldn't get in touch with what was going on. I had a friend in, that, that shot himself in the face accidentally under the gun in grade school. And I laughed and thought it was funny because he was a bully. And it, I, everyone thought I was Satan for that. But I couldn't, and they like, where's your empathy at? And I'm like, well, the guy got what was coming to him. He's a jerk. You know, and I, I always thought looking back at that, that I was really mentally deranged. I'm an alcoholic. That's what's wrong with me. That's what's been wrong with me. But bringing it a full circle to my sponsee, I was just telling him, you know, you're, you're barely kind of circling the landing strip right now. Uh, I think he has about six months sober and I said, you just be patient. You know, you're going to, have them eventually you'll understand why your family is on your case they don't understand that they don't want to see you do this again and and you're going to have empathy for how they feel you're going to have empathy for why they're on your case and descending on you and i you know i i obviously had plenty of stories to give them about my experience with that but um you know i I'm really kind of hammering home and, and through working with him, it's really become a full circle thing. All these meetings have been going through the past month, actually since the beginning of the year, I've really been focused on, you know, the reality of alcohol really isn't the problem with us. It's, it's our thinking. And I heard for so many years and years, I've been trying to get sober, like continuously sober for about 10 years. And I, and I heard so many times people go, it's, it's not our drinking, it's our thinking. And I was like, yeah, I get it. I heard you, I get it, shut up, move on. And I heard that last night and I'm like, oh my God, I actually understand what that means from here. I really, really resonate with what that means because now that the obsession of, for drinking has been removed from me, I really can get to work and can see what my real problem is. And it's the way I 
I, it's the way I respond or react to life, the way I rea react to everything. So, um, and that has completely changed my perspective of the book and how I look at the book and how I interact with people. It makes me want to go to meetings, not so I can get something from it, so, but for more for mm -hmm. what, I, what I can hopefully contribute to it. Um, it just, it, it this opens a whole Pandora's box of what this program really is for me. And um, I hope, you know, other people aren't as hard headed and stubborn as I am, but I've had a great sponsor help me um, kind of break, crack my head. It's like the hardest egg ever. So at any rate, yeah, I mean, you can tell me there's a door right there and I will go through the wall because I, I have to feel what it feels like to go through the wall, you know? I, I, I don't like doors. They're too easy. Easy things are, I don't like doing things the easy way. Ask my wife. I have to do things the hard way. I'm extremely stubborn, right? Yeah, anyways. But anyways, Mike, thanks again for letting me share. Sam, I miss you. Thanks, Mike. Welcome. Oh, I guess I'm sharing. Yeah. Okay, Jessica, alcoholic. Hey, Jessica. Um, I missed your share, unfortunately. I've heard you share before, though. And it's always, it, it was, I do remember it resonates, you know, you don't, you don't remember what people say, but you remember how you felt. And I remember feeling some relief when I, when I heard your share last. Um, yeah, I was just on the phone this morning on my way to work, uh, and talking, talking to somebody about the bedevilments and really looking at <clears throat> where I'm at in those bedevilments at almost eight years sober. Yeah. This month on the 21st, I'll be, I'll, I'll be eight years. And, and man, is it humbling to, to answer those questions right now and be really, really honest with her and say, I'm in the bedevilments right now, like a hundred percent. And, uh, and, but the, the good thing about, I mean, there's so many good things about that, but like the fact that I can look at myself in an honest way and, and do an inventory on a regular basis and and be okay with what that looks like because I know that there's a solution and I know that I'm in a program of solution and I know that you know it's just different levels of surrender that we go through and it just it it, it all has to do with the level of honesty that I'm willing to go to within myself and it's it's not it doesn't feel good I'll tell you that it's extremely painful. And uh, lately it's, it's been very painful. Uh, in, in early sobriety, my head could bring me to other places, other fantasy worlds, you know? It's like, ah, oh, I just won't think about that right now. I'll just get focused on this and, and then it'll be okay until it crashes, right? But I get a little bit of time with that and I have enough under my, uh, under my belt. It's not even about time, it's about, you know, program. And the people you put yourself around that's willing to tell you the truth and and not just you know blow smoke uh that i i don't i don't have the luxury of a fantasy world anymore <laughs> it's like when i'm when i'm not doing good in, in alcoholism i know it i know it and and i know what to do and and thank god right now i'm willing to do it especially with a baby on the way in about a month it's like you know it's <laughs> It's amazing. So anyways, that's, that's about all I got for you guys tonight. Thanks for calling on me. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. Hey, you know, Mike, a lot of times, um, you know, I, I look, I look at uh, an average AA talk and you hear what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. We talk about the transformation that happened a lot of it within the first you know, year or two years of working the steps or the first, you know, maybe sometimes three months, six months, whatever. Um, but, uh, and it's just kind of that, the, the storyline has that kind of arc and then you just finish off right there. But I mean, I've been sober 21 years and I've had tons of step experiences, like tons of step experiences, like huge, just as powerful, if not more powerful. And, and a lot of them where, you know, with good intentions, I've destroyed parts of my life with self-will or didn't realize, you know, that. I didn't realize I had an attachment to money and business and, and what I thought about until shit started going south, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I started getting squirrely. And then I've had experiences where, you know, I'm right in the head and, and everything's okay. You know, we had a, 
a guy at our business uh, do a fraud thing. Um, we had some guy steal somebody's identity and he stole a, stole a $70,000 car, you know, and we're getting ready to claim it on our insurance. And the insurance is now saying they don't, they don't cover that kind of fraud because of, you know, it was, we we're acting as an indirect lender. And man, it was so incredible how, you know, my brain started to go real south with that. And then all of a sudden I was just like, Hey man, you know what? We've, we've got it to lose it. And that's okay. You know, like I was, I'm not going to attach myself. It's not going to do any better than me having a sour, foul reaction. And it really, like, the, it was really from a lot of this stuff. You know, it took like 15 minutes for me to just get completely cool with it and talk to my partner and, you know, just say, hey, however this is supposed to work out, let's let it work out that way. Pray about it and move on. And I wasn't my whole, I mean, that's a lick <laughs> to absorb, you know, and uh, or at least for me it is. And, um, you know, anyway, that was stuff I worked out. But the the one of the things I want to ask you is, what about over like the last ten years? Can you touch on some of the highs and lows of like, let's say, the last decade with your? Uh, you had any of that kind of stuff that you can think of that uh, you'd like to share with us? I know you have. Um, well, not not really events. Um, one thing I've noticed, you talk about taking the steps and 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 seeing the results of it. One thing that I've when I first was going through the steps where I got desperate enough to go through the steps, and by the way, you know, when we're reading how it works at some of these, we balk, I balked at all the steps. Every time I got some relief, I'd stop until I got so desperate and uncomfortable that I was going to drink again and blow my brains out. And then I'd go take the other steps. So I begrudgingly went through all 12 steps and, and my life got good. And, uh, but I've just come to realize lately when, when I did all that the first time around, I was just trying to put the fires of my life out at that time. I mean, my life was a dumpster fire and I was taking those steps and making those amends to put out all those fires that I had all around me. What I didn't know then that I know now is that the work, some of that work that I did a long, long time ago is still paying me dividends today. Now that doesn't mean that I live off of what I did back then by any means, but I had no idea that the work I did, that was like, you know, my whole life was like, it's like I was growing a bunch of weeds. And, and what the steps did was let me chop down all those weeds and replant some decent seeds. And, and so all of a sudden I start harvesting good stuff and you reap more than you sow. And I didn't realize that the, you know, when my sponsor was trying to get me to do all these steps early on, I thought it was just to fix that right then. I didn't know that it was going to set a pattern and a foundation to guide me through the rest of my life, which is, which is a great awakening you know, that I, that I never heard that from anywhere else. And the other thing that I noticed, uh, I just celebrated a birthday, uh, you know, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. And uh, every year I relived that, those last days before I got sober. Cause I mean, it was a train wreck. I mean, it was just awful. And I hope I never forget that because if I ever forget it, maybe, it, you know, I won't think it was that bad, but it was that bad. And I always relived that. And I've always thought, I've thought throughout my whole sobriety that the grace of God entered me when I got sober. And I, and it just dawned on me about two weeks ago that I was walking toward the light the whole time, even in my darkest hour when things got just absolutely unbearable and the consequences were awful and, and that feeling of despair and hopelessness and all that something some higher power was dragging me toward the light then and i've never i've never looked at that i don't know why i hadn't been able to see that and so uh what it tells me is that whatever that higher power is out there it's strong stuff man i've i've spent a great deal of time trying to define god what what god what god looks like to me and i don't i've about decided the only reason why that i'm seeking out trying to understand god is where the where I can, I can get more of what I want. You know, it's just pointless to try to figure that out because uh, whatever that higher power is, just is, is an in, infinite supply of good. And, and, and that higher power has been, been with me the whole time, whether I want it or not. I heard somebody say in a meeting last week, well, God's a gentleman. He doesn't go where he's not invited. I think that's BS, man. Because you know, God was taking care of me when I was, you know, an absolute knucklehead. So, you know, that's one of the, one of the, that's the biggest re revelation I've had in a while. Uh, my lifestyle changed though. Uh, 
but after I started getting over that stuff, that's getting rid of that self-loathing, um, I, I feel more useful as a human being now than I ever have. And I don't do that perfectly, but I just, in general, I just have a feeling that everything's okay. And, and I have moments of real peace and serenity now uh, that sometimes they're fleeting and they're just a feeling or an emotion, but it's real peace and serenity. You know, uh, I thought absolute freedom was, you know, taking all the quaaludes I could and drinking all the whiskey I could and doing whatever else that was wrong. I thought that was real freedom and all that was was just building a prison for myself. Uh, I, I'm more comfortable as a human being I've ever as I've ever been overall. And that's kind of a gradual process doing like this, but it's on the uphill climb all the time. And that's great to report because I thought after maybe the first 15 years of sobriety, I thought, well, you got everything. You know, you've done the steps and blah, blah, blah. You got this and that and the other. And, and, and you're just going to plot along and go to meetings and march. But hell, it hadn't been that way at all. The second 15 years for me have been much more fulfilling and growing. And uh, as long as I stay awake, if I don't go back to sleep, if I, if I stay spiritually awake, you know, I know there's more stuff out there that I hadn't even thought about yet. Um, one thing, my, my first sponsor, when I had gotten into it with Diane yet again over something, I don't know what it was, he wrote down five things, he said, for relationships. And number one is be honest. Number two, add to. Number three is no expectations. I heard somebody talking a little while ago about where's the payoff for, for this and that and the other. And number four is don't keep score. And I mean, we all keep score, right? At least I do. And number five, trust God. So those five things, those are, are for relationships, you know, any kind of relationship. And that, he gave me that a long time ago. And I, I try to live by that stuff right there because uh, if I'm not keeping score, I just do things without a payoff, you know, because that's, that's the whole deal is to be good for nothing, as Chuck C said. I love that, man. You know, I, I've had that, uh, I've had those experiences over the last year where it's just, I feel so peaceful in the moment and so fulfilled. Like I'm just savoring the moment and I feel so great exactly as it is, like exactly as it's going on, like exactly with what's in front of me. I love my backyard, so to speak, you know, and I just like hanging out there. And I used to run from that place. Um, I also love what Chuck C, he'd always say, he would say, it's none of my business what they think of me. It's my business what I think of them. And I always thought that was really, really good and really powerful. Well, we got a few more minutes here, and I think we should probably, um, uh, we should probably call on uh, Judy L. Uh, because she turned her face on, and now we can see her, and so I can pick on her and see what she has to say tonight. Well, thanks, Sam. Hi. <laughs> I thought I'd escaped. Um, and like everybody else, I was busy eating my dinner, listening carefully. Mike, thank you so much for a beautiful talk. Um, my thoughts as you were talking about that, there were a bunch of things that you said that were really useful. And, but what it triggered in me was a reminder of how strong my ego is to turn almost everything into yet another way to look at myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think having a sponsor in that kind of sharing was at first the difficulty of, of, of how my ego and how I wanted to be seen by other people. And that always got in the way, of, not of being honest, but of, well, of being honest, actually. I think if that's true, it's of being honest. Um, I want to appear even to myself to be the kind of person that I want to be. And, um, and the other thing you said that, that really struck me about work was that I always thought that I had worked so hard and, and I had, but I was shocked to find out over a long period of time, just how much my ego was invested in that job and who I was and how I was on the job and what it made me was a really bad employee because you can't be a good employee when you're so worried about getting fed that you can't give to like traditions to the unity and the well-being of the group itself. And I was so busy worrying about other stuff 
And yet I wanted always to feel as though I was hardworking. I was doing everything I should better than most, of course. And, and maybe I was barely doing what I should and maybe barely better than anybody. But that kind of truth was not possible for me because I didn't think that my job, um, I, I thought my job needed to support my self-image. I liked a job with the title. And I had told myself that it was God's job, that when I got it, it was a gift. It was a blessing. I desperately needed to support my family. And I had this job and that um, I only got after I finally got uh, graduated from school. And I could show my children the benefit of having an education. And with all the right intentions, one more time, I walk into something with the right intention and then still turn it on its head and make it about me and make it less about my trusting um, in the goodness of the whole, in bringing God into everything I do. And, and over a period of time, I had been telling myself in my delusion that this was God's job. And when it's time, I'll leave it and it'll be okay because it's not about me. It's my job is to do God's work. And I, I went around holy as hell for a long time with that idea. And then when my job went away, I found that I was so invested in that job that I didn't know who I was without it. And I hadn't known that about myself. One more time, I'd fooled myself into thinking that I was doing this spiritual thing. And yet one more time, I had created something that was in my imagination and in my illusion. And, and I'm always shocked. So when you were talking about work, it really made me think about how that relationship with work really should have been, could have been, and, and was not as God-centered as I thought it was. And then when it was gone, I realized how large a focus that was in my sense of who I was. Uh, fortunately, like Don was talking about, I'm working with myself now, so it's kind of hard to really not get along with people. When I work for myself and I'm alone most of the day, it's, um, it's a whole lot easier to do a 10 step because I'm not nearly as angry at myself as I was when there were other people to deal with. So um, I, I really appreciated your talk and your perspective on how to take, not how to, but the fact that we take this program into the, all the many aspects of our life, we don't just do it at a meeting, but it has to filter through in all the other places and, and live that with trust. Thanks so much for calling on me, Sam. Hey, thank you. I really, uh, I'll let Mike type this out for a minute, so I'll talk for a second till we tag it out. Hey, but I really, uh, I really love those words that Bill uses they look just like, I mean, because it, it, to me, it, it's, it's, it's like the beginning of a spiritual experience. And he always says, suddenly I realized, right. you know, suddenly I realized that we'll suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Not that God starts doing for us what we could not do for us. He's been doing that for a long time. But suddenly I realized, like at the end of a movie, you look back, you know, Kurt Z always talks about that internal revelatory experience. It's like if you watch this mystery movie and you keep trying to figure out where all the pieces are and at the end of it, somebody explains it to you and then goes back and you go, oh, God, look at where God's been all over that. That's incredible. I mean, I've had tons of those experiences just put hey, goosebumps all over me, you know, um, and, uh, you know, and then he says that in this book, he says, suddenly I realized what the matter was. He's staring at the prayer of St. Francis. And suddenly I realized what the matter was. And uh, I, I love that. Um, so anyway, Mike, how you doing with that typing, buddy? Oh, we shouldn't. Have, we should have got somebody else to do that. Maybe take a little picture. There we go. Uh, getting there. I'm getting there, Sam. All right. And um, anyway, so that that wraps us up for tonight. Did you, Mike, can you think of anything that you have not shared that you'd like to share with this fine group? Anything uh, that you just you might look back and go, man, I wish I would have said that. No, I don't think so. I think you said it, man. I really do. I'm really glad you shared. I, that was a beautiful share. That was a, I, that's one that we, I'll re-listen to several times and get a lot out of it, man. I, I really appreciate your honesty. And, and uh, man, I think you hit all the notes and I appreciate you giving us your time tonight. So uh, Thanks, I love it. So, Just have fun, man. That's all right. That's all right. Grandson.
My grandson gave me this Dr. Zeus tie for Christmas. It's my favorite. I love it. Mommy, yeah. I don't take myself too seriously. And, and, you know, and the cool thing is when those dependencies are identified and they start to go away, you're like, God, man, how have I been living with that thing just stuck to me all this time? Like, wow, I've been living my whole life wondering about, you know, what people I don't even give a shit think about me half the time. Like, why the, why the hell have I been doing that? Or why have I been been worried about this money thing it's money's no big deal it's just money shit half of it you know like it's an intangible thing i've been living and dying by this you know or whatever it is so uh anyway that's what i think is fun about this meeting but the way we close it up is since so we don't have like a big schizophrenic you know 98 people saying the lord's prayer the delay thing um <laughs> sounds more sounds like some scary shit more than it does harmonious you know like a bad acid trip or something so the way i do is we like to go to our inner room just turn our mutes on and just say the Lord's Prayer to ourselves, and uh, we'll meet you back here in a second for all who care to join us. Thank you, guys. Amen. Thank you, guys. Mike, Thanks, thank Sam. you for your time tonight. Looking good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Sam. Bye. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Mike.